Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. Welcome to another episode of Indie Beacon Radio. This is your host, B. Alan Bourgeois, and I have with me Michelle Munzer, who has written the book called The Hills of Meat, The Forest of Bone. Um, so that sounds like a murder mystery type or a scary thriller type thing. What is it? It sounds horror, but it's a little bit more a uh, squidgy, weird, buddy adventure with an extra helping of weird. Okay. What age range is it for? Um, I would say for adults, late teens or adults. I wouldn't want to inflict my humor on anyone too young. <laughs> okay. A little bit too much there over their head. Which with today's kids, you never know, but understandable. Um, so tell us about it. It's an adventure, spooky, kind of fun thing, adventure. Give us the lowdown. It's sort of an irreverent romp through a strange, bizarre world. Uh, essentially, there's a traveler who walks this dead god labyrinth, and she has her shark man assistant. They get in some trouble, and they end up in a landscape of living meat that's trying to eat them. But they have a very humorous view to life, so they take everything in stride. So it's kind of a weird buddy adventure romp through, like I said, a, a very bizarre landscape. So it's kind of horrific and humorous and everything all at once. Okay, now you said meat instead of saying zombies. Is there a reason actual, for that? No, the land is actually made, it's a living land of meat and bone and organs and it's kind of a slightly gross. <laughs> okay, it almost sounds like a butcher shop with all the leftovers laying around. <laughs> yeah, think of it just like an actual landscape made out of just flesh. Okay, I've got to ask, what made you think of something like that? It was actually born from the title. So I kind of came up with the title first, and then I was curious what this world was. Plus, we were kind of doing a, uh, this is part of a shared world project with some friends. So we're all kind of writing in the same world where it's this god died and so this labyrinth kind of built up off of the maggots consuming his corpse and they sort of butted little worlds off so there's all these little worlds just sort of budding like pestilent little sores off this dead god's corpse and you can if you're a labyrinth traveler you can travel between these worlds by just popping out of them through a gate going through the little labyrinth find another gate pop into a new world okay now you have um not only that book but several others correct um, so I'm mostly a short fiction writer. So I have a, a lot of stories in various uh, anthologies, et cetera. Uh, probably can't see the stack behind me, but yeah, I do a bunch back there. Okay, so you specialize more in the short stories and this is your first full length novel? Uh, this is a novella. Novella, okay. Um, so then you said you're working with other authors. So are they also doing novellas or are some of them growing a little longer or what? Uh, yes, they're primarily working in novellas. It's a going through a small publisher, Falstaff, and they focus on the, the shorter length novella works. So one of the authors is Natanya Barron, so she has one of the weird worlds, and Jane Gates also has one of the uh, novellas in this little shared world collection. Okay, so I, out of curiosity, I, this is a weird landscape that you've created, and there's no doubt to it. So are your other stories similar to that, or are they just different types of genres? What? So my short fiction ranges from the super weird to things that are a little bit more contemporary and more recognizable. Um, I, I tend to write a lot, I do tend to write a lot of weird stuff, but I also write a smidge of straight up horror. I write a splash of science fiction and I'm very heavily into second, secondary world dark fantasy. Okay, so what got you started in all of this different mix of, of craziness? So when I started writing, I was writing a lot more traditional fantasy because that's what I'd grown up reading. But as I kind of joined the industry and I met more people and I kind of got a little more exposure to other works out there, I found that I really had a love of just strangeness, sort of things that are both beautiful and bizarre. And I, I kind of fell down that rabbit hole and my style and my writing followed right after. Okay, so out of curiosity, have you ever challenged yourself to write something a little bit more uh, normal in some respects? 
Oh, goodness. It is harder for me to write normal, so that would be a challenge. Um, I said I, I started off writing more in that style, and it just hasn't quite stuck. Okay. With the craziness and, and, and sense of humor that you have, do you find it fun to see how far you can go? I find it fun to see how far I can stretch my imagination. Like I'm not necessarily about like pushing comfort boundaries for my readers. I'm more about just exploring things, kind of playing with language. I love playing with language. And part of the hills of meat, the forest of bone is just, it's a giant, a giant playing zone. It's like a big sandbox that I get to just have fun with. Okay. Now with the, the sense of humor that you have, is there a comedian inside that's wanting to get out or you just use that a, as a, a relief moment? I have a very odd sense of humor. Um, I do like, like people who I'm close to, I do make a lot of jokes around and I like to kind of I like to play off what people are saying. So it, it, that kind of definitely built into it. I love to play off words and play off of interactions. I, I find like when I write super dark stuff, I actually don't tend to put any humor in it. it. I tend to either go all the way dark or I go all the way just bizarre, funny, weird, strange sense of humor kind of thing. So one or the other. Between those two, what would you say is the more enjoyable aspect of writing? Ooh. Going really dark or the comedy or, or, or what? That's a tough one. Because like the dark, like I enjoy, I really enjoy exploring the depths of emotions. And as a writer, obviously we want to torture all of our characters in the worst ways possible. And so it's the most fun when they're at their most pained. And I love to see the ways that we hurt ourselves, that we undo ourselves. And that's one of my big focuses. And I can only really do that in the darker stuff. That's a little bit harder for me personally to pull off in the more humorous pieces. But the humorous pieces are kind of a relief because sometimes you do just want to sit down and just, just have fun, just write something weird and just go with it and not have to like, worry about weighing yourself down with all the extra emotions that's so really mood dependent okay so there's two more good questions um, that most authors end up dealing with one of them um, we always tend to write something from our life and what we do so how much of this can you relate to or do you relate to any of it I do I do I I secretly, secretly, seed in bits and pieces of myself into a lot of works. Um, sometimes it's just taking experiences from childhood or something and putting just a tiny moment in something or a line. Like it's actually, it's kind of sad. Like when my husband will read my work, he'll like run into a single line and be like, hey, I know where that came from. So like some of it does draw from actual experiences and some of it also draws just I don't know, I guess just for my personal kind of life view and how I interact with the world. So I, I do find that even though not all of my stories, like not definitely do not think that all of my stories are my life. <laughs> um, there's a particularly super dark one that just came out recently in uh, Fireside Magazine. And that is definitely not my life and not drawing from like super personal experience. But I find like we can draw from our personal pains a lot and that feeds much into our fiction. And then every now and then you seed some of your personal experiences in, and that gives kind of an extra bit of depth to pieces. So are you by chance a um, news junkie? Do you a get your idea? A news junkie? Oh, I check my news regularly, but uh, I don't think I would call myself a junkie on that aspect. Okay, the reason I ask that is because some people will get some of those dark stories or some stories in general I've, I've even done it with my first book it came from a new story and then i explored it and, and to see what was going on so i was curious if that's where you were getting some of your ideas yeah i find since most of my work is in the secondary world fiction it's a little bit more difficult to take modern news and quite apply that over 
but I do have a series of stories last year that were very inspired by the Me Too movement. And that just, that kind of hit me and that bled into like, I think three of the short stories that I sold over the last year and had come out. So, so sometimes modern times do kind of bleed into what I'm working on. Okay. So going back to the um, heels of meat, which I'm still visualizing all that meat and bones and stuff like that. <laughs> definitely not a pleasant sight. If I can't <laughs> sleep good tonight, it's going to be your fault. Um, and also talking about the fact of using our lives as part of our characters or whatever and stuff. Is there anything in that book that you can say is yes, part of me or no, it's not, or might be a little thought of? Oh, I am not particularly like the main character in that, which actually made it a very challenging novella to write. Um, I, I don't tend to quite approach the world in the same way that Hetha Aran does. <laughs> um, what mostly kind of seeded in from my life into that novella was the main character was based on a Dungeons and Dragons character I had played. So I kind of took a and d thing and dragged it in. And yeah, just, just kind of stole the personality wholesale and threw it in there. Okay. Now, the fact that you've written it and there are other people writing in the same concept do you see yourself writing a, a follow-up to it or an addition to the storyline or anything like that? I would definitely like to. It's in my plans to do so. I've been kind of distracted by short fiction a bit lately, <laughs> but I do need to go in because there's a lot more adventures set up for them. It's definitely the kind of playground that you can just jump in and keep having fun with. And I kind of want to know what's, uh, what's happening with them now after what happened to them by the end of the book. This is a really off the wall question, but I'm just kind of curious, because again, visualizing all this meat laying around and stuff. As you're writing this, did any recipes come to mind? I do my best not to associate my cooking with my writing, because I write a lot about food, but the ways in which I write about food are not appropriate for cooking for people. <laughs> I was just curious if, you know, you might have created an actual recipe, you know, oh. as you're tracing through the meat or, or something. Just, again, yeah. it's off the wall, quirky. I did have a lot of fun naming teas because the, uh, the main character, Hetha Iran, she's a labyrinth trader, so she goes from world to world, trading goods across them. And one of her favorite things is to have drinks of tea. And like in the very early beginning, she's talking about what they call uh, experiential blends, which are blends that have an emotion attached to them. And so I had a lot of fun like naming those and like wondering, man, that would be really cool if that existed. Like I want these teas. Okay, so have you thought about trying to concoct them? Become a tea blender? Yeah, I see what happens. Talk to, I've got some friends who do tea blending. I should maybe go have a word with them. Yeah, it might be another book or a novella for you to write. <laughs> but we're at that point where we need to take a break for our sponsors, but we'll be right back. All right. What started as a love letter to her son has become an international love letter for all parents to their children. Now you can read acclaimed author Shanna Lee Charbonneau's story to your children. When her son was very sick, she calmed him by singing her own song to him. She turned that song into the book, My Mama Loves Me, I'm Her Little Boy. She wrote three more magical books for all parents and kids six and under. Available at Indie Lector, Amazon, and all local and national outlets. and poet Denise Bryson. I am the author of The Things That Crossed My Mind, Love's Reality, both in book and audio form. I am also noted as one of the best poets of 2011. 
have two new projects coming up. One is the Blinky series, where Blinky tells us all about our coins and our bills for our children. I also have a book coming out called Say Ye. It's quotes from Denise Bryson. Just inspirational and that will help you along the way. Thank you for watching or listening to this show. Andy Lecter is proud to sponsor this programming. As a thank you for listening or watching, we would like to give you a 10% coupon code that you can use on our bookstore at IndieLector.store. Use coupon code VIDEO19. Again, that's IndieLector.store, coupon code VIDEO19 for a 10% discount on any purchase. Thank you. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us. Welcome back to another episode of Indie Beacon Radio. We've been talking with Michelle Munzer, who has written several short stories and a novella. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask earlier, uh, Michelle, is the characters. Um, how many of your characters that you've created are actually talking to you on a somewhat regular basis saying, you know what, you're not done with me, you need to write more? Oh, goodness. Most of my short fiction is standalone. So once I torture my poor characters, they're kind of uh, done with and explored. But Hefa and Moby definitely would like some more stories. Moby being her shark man assistant. So they, they've definitely been kind of poking at me over the past year, letting me know they've got more to do. Okay, now shark man immediately draws me to the news of the day, which is, all the shark attacks. So has he said anything about that or said, you know what, we're being treated unfairly here as a shark or something? Uh, he has not. He tries to keep himself very civilized. He does not generally bite people, though he does have issues. If you accidentally cut yourself near him, there's just some instincts that are a little difficult to hold back. But you know, he's, he's a very, very calm, very controlled gentleman. <laughs> okay. Um, You've written a lot of short stories. You say you were just working on some more. What is your plan over the next year as far as any stories? Or, or are you going to try a full novel or anything of that nature? Um, I want to get the a sequel to The Hills of Meat. So I think I, I think I prefer to stay in the novella territory. I find I'm by nature a much shorter writer. And so writing a full-length novel just takes so much extra energy. That, that, that's kind of rough. I, I do have a couple under. I was agented. We didn't quite make the sale on the novel, and I just kind of went back to my comfort zone, which is terrible. I know, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love short fiction, and it's a natural length for me, and novellas are probably my longest comfort zone. Okay. Well, you have enough short stories. I can see you doing a compilation of your own stories for your own book and stuff. So. Oh, yeah. Make a collection. Yeah. And I've also Definitely got a lot a good of poetry out, so I'm looking at maybe putting a poetry collection together. There you go. So you have a lot of options there and stuff. Um, working with other people in the same concept of, of the Hills of Meat, is that a challenge for you or are you pretty much on your own and you don't have to worry about what they're doing? So for the most part, we created the world in a way that we could all kind of romp around in it and not step on each other's toes too much. But it's a lot of fun to also draw from each other. So like Natanya Barron's book actually kind of overlaps with a piece of mine and it gives you the explanation of how the Hills of Meat came to be. So you do share some information with them to help yeah. them along the process and stuff. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Have you thought of doing that with other um, types of stories, working with other groups? I have considered it. I think that would be a lot of fun just to kind of have like a little shared world short fiction project and have everyone kind of play along with that. And I've, I've done like, I guess at least an anthology on that, the Debris and Detritus anthology, which was on... Uh, basically Greek gods that never were kind of thing, this name debris and detritus. And so that was kind of a shared project with a bunch of fellow authors. But I also know that I have a really specific style and I, I sometimes worry <laughs> that I, I might just kind of 
not fit very well. <laughs> Well, there is a contest coming out in 2020. It's called We Fiction, which teams up authors, um, either two or four authors together to write a novel um, based on submissions that um, readers submit. Um, they submit the characters, the locations, the plot, plot twist, and then the group gets together and creates the story accordingly and stuff. So it What's is a contest. Yeah, it, we Fiction. We fiction. Okay. I check that out. That sounds kind of fun. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a new way of, of getting authors to share um, readers and also getting readers to find out about these new authors and vice versa and just help the overall marketplace for the author and, and the readers as well and stuff. You never know who you might discover, you know, because you're working with somebody else and stuff. But anyways, not, this is your, your time, not mine. <laughs> um, so with the short stories with everything else. Is there anything else in a creative aspect that you wanted to do? Mm. Not necessarily writing or anything, but just anything creative. Oh, goodness. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I find my creative outlet is mostly writing and I, I like to cook a lot in my free time, but Again, like making recipes based off my worlds is a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew how to sew, I would make a plush doll of Moby. But I'm kind of, I'm a terrible sewer. I'm way too impatient for that. I'm, just, I'm too impatient for a lot of things. So the writing allows you to get that impatience out so that you can control what's happening, the speed of it, processing and all that stuff. That's, That's understandable. That's my main outlet. Okay. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so for a word of advisement um, or encouragement for someone who wants to write, what would you suggest? Ooh. My main suggestion is to experiment, because you're not going to really know what your personal style is and what you really want to write about until you start just kind of reading widely and then also experimenting with different different styles and different subjects. I mean, until you do that, you're not going to know whether or not you love or hate second person or, you know, or if you like what you like to write about, really. Because, like, what I started writing about is so different from what I write now. And all that's because I, I sat down and I was like, I'm going to make a short story and it's going to focus on description. I'm going to do a short story and I'm going to focus on this different POV. And I... I kind of tried out some different things to kind of develop what it was I wanted to do. So would you say you're more of the by the seat type of writer where you just go at it or more of a planner? So when I write shorter things, I am by the seat. So my short fiction and flash fiction, I'm very much just kind of going as it goes. But when I go into novella and longer length, I definitely have to plan. It just it gets too much to hold all at once. And there's too many details that get lost. So I have to have at least a loose plan, just kind of an idea of I'm going here, then I'm going here, then I'm going here. And that plan may totally change as I write. And then I'll just delete that section out and make a new little plan following up with that new information. So it definitely depends upon the length. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the characters as well, whether or not they say, you know what, I don't like this, and you're going to switch back. And yeah. They always. can be very opinionated. <laughs> Cool. Well, we're at another point where we need to take a break for our sponsors, and we'll be right back. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author of the book, You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents. That was a question I had to ask myself some 16 years ago, and you'll have to ask the same question. I had a father-in-law with dementia a mother with Alzheimer's and a dad with Parkinson, all at the same time. every one on the town council were thieves and murderers. That's what happened in Bandera, Texas in 1873. John Cruder was the marshal, yet he needed to operate outside the law 
in order to balance the scales of justice. He is the Midnight Marauder. You can find his books on Amazon.com and TopWesterns.com in paperback, digital, and audio. I'm Roy Clinton, and I hope you'll read The Midnight Marauder. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. Welcome back to the ending of Indie Beacon Radio. We have been talking with Michelle Morser. Sorry about that. I was saying it well at the first two, and I messed it up at the end here. Um, you've talked about the, the um, hills of meat, and, and I still visualize the meat laying all over the place and the bones sticking up, and even trees made out of bones and what have you. And every so often, a, a vulture is popping up and stuff. But anyways, um, <laughs> you're working with people to create a whole world around the, that concept and stuff, which is really interesting. And you are wanting to work on um, the sequel and stuff. What is your time frame for that sequel? Oh, goodness. That is a great question, <laughs> which I've been asked too many times this year. Um, so I, I think I've, I've got a short story I'm trying to finish up right now. And when I'm done with that, I think I'm in the clear around the end of this year to start maybe working on the sequel. It's been kind of a rough past year or so, so I haven't been quite in the good mindset for the particular style of humor that goes on in this book, because it, it's, it's very particular, and that, I said, it, it's hard for me to just write out of the blue, and haven't been in the best mind space the past year, but I think, I think things clearing up, so maybe end of this year, I can start kicking in and uh, get my, get, get Hepha and Moby into some more trouble. Okay, and, and I'm really curious about that man shark, I mean, it's just, I, I know I've yeah, seen that in like cartoons a, and stuff, but yeah, it, it, it's like a really stocky short guy. It's like super broad shoulders and the broad shoulders are just shark heads. So big old shark head, full jaw out and stocky man. Interesting combination. I've got to ask, what made you come up with that combination? I think that one just kind of came out of the blue and then his personality just kind of developed from it. Cause I needed a straight man kind of to balance out Hetha because she's very over the top and bouncing around kind of super hyper ADHD. And so I just needed something solid and sharks are very solid. That they are. Okay. Um, we've got a few minutes left at the, the end of the show. And so the biggest thing is how can people find you? your website, your social media, all that good stuff. Tell us all about that. So you can always hit up my website, and that's www.michellemunzler.com. Um, also, I am on Facebook. I may not post as often, but I totally click like on all the things. <laughs> and on Facebook, I am Michelle Munzler. And I think I'm the only Michelle Munzler on there now. There was another, but she got married. So <laughs> it all belongs to me. And Twitter or any other social media? I am technically on Twitter, but I only respond if I get a DM because I'm very obsessive about reading all the things. So I can't go to Twitter because <laughs> then I will spend all my time trying to read everything and there's not enough time for that. Okay. And your books, of course, are available on Amazon and all the regular um, things, yes. you're, the anthologies you're in, which um, just to go through some of them. You have supernatural horror short stories. Um, Upside Down, The Lone Star of the Sky, uh, Lone Star, and, uh, yeah, that's the same one, um, Tales from a Lone Star, and so many more. Um, what is the total amount of anthologies you are in? Um, so some of them are, actually, it's just, it's the act of selling short fiction for the most part. The Lone Star ones are actually uh, anthologies that my writer's group made. I don't know if you know William Ledbetter. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, William Ledbetter is the uh, head of our writers group and Melanie Fletcher. And so a bunch of us got together and we've just put two, uh, two anthologies together of stories that we wanted to kind of share out with that. And that would be both the Lone Star anthologies. Uh, the rest are sometimes just you'd see a project come up and you're like, I have a perfect story for that. Just have to go for it. Great. 
And with that, that is the end of our show. And I thank you very much for being with us and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website at IndieBeacon.com.